Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of LOAC TV. I'm your host, Curtis Findlay, for the Library of American Comics. Today, we're going to be talking about this book here, Dick Tracy, Volume 1. And But before we do that, I just want to make a few notes. Uh, first of all, different background. I don't get to display my books today. The kids are out of school, and this is a later time slot, so I have to go to different rooms so that I get some peace and quiet. But... Uh, We'll still have a great conversation, and there's an amazing bookshelf you'll see when I bring in my special guest in a little bit, so just stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, and you'll be notified whenever we have a new live stream coming up. Uh, you can like this one as well and uh, help you know get those YouTube algorithms going. Uh, and don't forget to find us on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. Just look for LOA Comics and you'll find us there. Um, and I have an amazing Facebook group where um, we have a bunch of like-minded comic strip enthusiasts who love to just talk about comic strips all day and especially the collected editions comic strips that's kind of what we, we do so look for the library of american comics newspaper appreciation group newspaper comics appreciation group and uh and that's how i know my special guest here he is a an active member of the group as well i'm gonna let's bring him on to our show this is jem selamet hi jem hey curtis thanks for having me now you are all the way on the other side of the world from me you are in australia right I am. I'm 13 hours ahead in the future. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> this is, it's Saturday morning for you? It is. It's Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Uh, and uh, we are kind of like the Tatooine of locations as far as we are in the middle of uh, almost the desert. But uh, it's a little <laughs> cosmopolitan. And I love your bookshelf. You have a an incredible uh, selection of comic strips from all sorts of eras and all sorts of styles and all sorts of publishers as well. Um, and you told me uh, that you are actually fairly new to just comic strips in general. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. I, as far as, uh, I mean, I've probably been reading comic strips for about four years now. Um, just haven't come off reading traditional comics and graphic novels and all that. And um, it wasn't until a uh, local comic book shop, uh, Quality Comics here in Perth is one of the few, but they, um, the, the owner there, Keith, he's really knowledgeable on everything comics. And it wasn't until I think at a point he was just kind of telling me about various comic strips and just over time. And I was like, oh, that does sound interesting. I should probably look into that at some point. And um, yeah, it's actually funny. Like the story of this, uh, this volume today we're going to be talking about is um, uh, we actually had in 2014, we had a, one of our few conventions we have, we had uh, Ted Adams and Chris Ryle come over uh, as yeah. far as the IW, and they had, an, they had a booth here and uh, we imported a bunch of books into stock. And uh, yeah, this was actually one of the ones that was on the shelf at my local comic shop. And I thought I'd grab this in the second volume. And um, yeah, so it's just kind of fortuitous that that would happen, that this comic would actually come as a result of that and the whole chain of this would have come from that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't realize that. So this book that we're going to talk about today is the yeah. reason you got into comic strips. Pretty much it is. I'd say it's probably this and I think uh, Walton Skies, uh, Walton Skies, which is the Gasoline Alley strips. But these yeah. two were the talked about ones. And I, I think I really loved this for its kind of, you know, the, the, the crime genre and all that, which we'll talk about. But yeah, this kind of spearheaded the whole thing. Wow, that's fantastic. So over the past four years, I can see you've just, you dove in with all of the books you have back there. What are some of your favorites? I have. Um, probably I'd say, I'd, I'd say uh, from the Loic range, definitely Dick Tracy. It's, I, I can't claim I've read all of it, but from what I've read, I'm very much loving the slow burn of it. It's one of those ones I think I'd probably keep reading as time goes on as I get older. Um, I'm, I definitely dig a lot of Roy Crane stuff like Captain Easy and, uh, and uh, what was the other one? But um, uh, Rip Kirby, that's also a great mm, series yes. as well. Alex Raymond's fantastic. Like his artwork is just absolutely amazing. It's ahead of its time. Um, uh, yeah, I guess there's a lot. Of, uh, I quite enjoyed a lot of this amazing Spider-Man run. That um, especially that early Stan Lee and John Romita. Right. But, yeah. So fantastic. There's just a. It's like picking a favorite child, which I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so if any of you are watching us live and you would love to leave a comment, you're more than welcome to. You can leave them on Facebook or you can leave them on YouTube. And uh, here's a comment from Josh. He says, such great shelves. So thanks, Josh, for being thanks, here. Josh. He also says, uh, Jem, that your volume is a little on the low side. So I don't know if that's something you can adjust. Oh, um, okay. So, But uh, we're going to, while you while you fiddle with that, I just want to sure. talk about this book a little bit. Um, 
just in case you were wondering, this actually technically isn't a book by Library of American Comics. The Dick Tracy series started um, before, li before Dean was doing stuff with the Library of American Comics. He was, uh, it was started by Ted Adams and Chris Ryle. They got the, uh, the, the rights to Dick Tracy. And because they saw the success of the Peanuts books, the Fantagraphics was doing, the complete Peanuts. And um, yep, there's one right there. And as you can see, hold that one back up again. Hold that one back up again. You can see that the design is like so similar with the, it, like they pretty much just kind of copied it. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the size of it and everything because the Peanuts books were selling like hotcakes. Like they were doing so well. And it's like, well, what can we do? And uh, so they started Dick Tracy. And so the first six volumes of Dick Tracy are this more peanuts size style. Um, and then around the same time, Dean, who was buddies with Ted Adams and all of them, started the Library of American Comics and, and partnered with IDW as a partner, publishing partner and was doing Terry and the Pirates and Little Orphan Annie. And eventually um, Ted just said, hey, Dean, why don't you take over the uh, production of the, of the Dick Tracy books? And, and Dean was all for it. And then that's why we get volume seven is a much bigger size because Dean was like, well, if I'm taking over it, I'm gonna do it uh, at the same size that I'm doing like the Little Orphan Annie books and such. So they got uh, a much, bigger, bigger. We'll, we'll take a, a closer look a little bit later at the insides to compare just how, how, what kind of a difference we're looking at in terms of the dailies and the Sundays. Um, one of, uh, yeah, so let's see. One of the things that you'll note about this book also is that uh, the, the Sundays are in black and white, uh, opposed to pretty much every other Loek book where the Sundays are in color. And that's, that's how Ted started it when um, when he he first started the, the strip, and so when Dean took it over, he said to himself, "Well, um, I'm just going to keep on doing the dailies in black and white. I mean, the Sundays in black and white, uh, just to keep it consistent in that sense." Uh, and now, now that he's now that the whole series of 29 volumes, all of Chester Gold's uh, Dick Tracy has been published, people are like, "Oh man." It's too bad that the Sundays are not in color, um, but you know that's just one of those things. It's still great to to have the entire run, uh, like twenty nine volumes, is pretty remarkable for any book series to get to. Very much so. Um, any book series of twenty nine volumes is just unheard of, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what should we talk about this book? I'm gonna I'm going to uh, turn on my second camera here while we talk about this, so that we can get. A look at the inside. And I'll give us a little solo. I'll probably preface by saying that, the, as as Curtis mentioned there, the the book design was originally kind of based on that peanuts look, um, and it was actually designed by uh, where I'm from, Perth Elm, uh, Ashley Wood. So funny little tidbit there, but um, nice. Yeah, but uh, it's the gorgeous little book. Even the even the earlier six, like the even though they were upgraded to a larger format once the Library of American Comics came aboard, it's still, they are still gorgeous little volumes of these. And you definitely get your, your bang for buck as far as the content in each of these. I'm, you can spend hours and hours still digesting just one of these volumes. Absolutely. I love these monochromatic end papers. It gives a real nice kind of splash to, a, to the, the beginning of the book. The, the, the splash kind of carries through these first few pages. It is really, really nicely designed. The pages are a little bit glossier than uh, what what Loak typically uses, oh, okay, uh, yes. but not uh, unreasonably glossy. Not not a really big shine. Uh, and the introduction here is by Max Allen Collins, whom uh, people may b best know him as uh, um, the the author of Road to Perdition. But he took over Dick Tracy after Chester Gould retired for quite a number of years. Exactly. And yeah, noted crime writer as well. He's got a series of various uh, uh, sorry, uh, crime novel genre books. But um, Yeah, yeah. Very accomplished writer. Mm -hmm. And, and he does a good... Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. 
you got, I was just going to say the uh, the run. Chester's ran from his run ran from nineteen thirty one to nineteen seventy seven. Yep. And uh, yeah, Max took over in after seventy seven as the successor. That's, that's such a long time. Thirty one to seventy seven is in a, in a remarkable career for anybody. Very much so. Five decades, I think they say in one of the other books I was reading. Yeah. I want to read a little snippet of 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 the intro here. It says, Gould's Dick Tracy hit the popular culture in a way very few individual artists ever do. Bing Crosby revolutionized popular music. Um, revolutionizing popular music comes to mind with Elvis and the Beatles having a similar impact in later eras from the silver screen, Al Jolson, um, Milton Berle, I, I Love Lucy, Dragnet turned television into something more than radio with pictures, uh, all of this kind of stuff. And then it goes on to, uh, to saying, where did that go? Um, basically that this is, this is just something, what Dick Tracy did for comic strips um, was, was unseen through any other uh, comic strip at this point. Uh, we had a few adventure, action adventure strips, but Dick Tracy really um, had, had the realism, he had the grit. It was, uh, as Josh uh, has, has another comment here, he says, I was surprised reading that first that first volume at how comically violent some of those strips are. It was very violent. It was over the top, um, a little, you know, maybe a little tame compared to today's standards, but it was definitely pushing the limits um, back in the day. Uh, I so it, on, I was just going to say, I will comment on that, the fact that um, I kind of liken it to like the, if you think of these modern day reboots of the James Bond series, where it's like before you know him as this over the top kind of, character with his gadgets and his, you know, two-way wristwatch and he's yeah. kind of, uh, he's really, you know, larger than life rogues gallery. He is just a detective, you know, like a, he's on, you know, he's a plain clothes detective and he's just got his wits and his wild. And that's sort of the charm of these early books. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the features at the beginning of this book is an interview between Chester Gold, Max Allen Collins, and um, uh, a, a big fan of re and Dick Tracy researcher, Matt Masterson. And uh, there's a lot of really cool insights and in just about gold and his life and his interests and influences. So uh, very cool to check that out as well. Uh, it's a very long interview. It is, it was. <laughs> and then once, once we get into the meat of the book, this actually starts by collecting the, um, the the preview or like the, the tryout strips called plain clothes tracy these are the strips that were not published in in the newspapers but were the tryout ones that landed chester gold the gig and you can see he already has his uh, you know his, that's definitely dick tracy there he's got the character but then they suggested instead of calling it plain clothes tracy they go with the um the nickname for detective dick dick tracy a bit of a tenacity on Chester Gould's part because I was reading up in, in this lovely volume by Sunday Press, which is oh, uh, hold on, let me let me bring that up just a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, whoops, there it is. There we go. Uh, so by Sunday Press, uh, sister imprint to Library of American Comics. But um, there's a great uh, couple of page intro. Um, one of them is by uh, Peter Toomey, who we've had on the we've had on the show here. Paul Paul Toomey. Paul Paul, sorry. Yep. Uh, it's 8 a.m. That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but there's a great uh, there's a great intro that does actually talk about how he uh, Chester was uh, trying to apply to that um, that uh, what's it called the syndicate basically, and and they just kind of kept shooting him down with these different attempts, different ideas, and he had like, they were short lived a lot of his his previous runs, and it wasn't until this one here that they yeah like I said the suggestion to change the name and that kind of and start with an origin story. Yeah. So yeah, what took it. It's great, yeah. So once we get into the actual strips themselves, um, yeah, things aren't exactly the same as the plain clothes, Tracy. Um, hold that book up compared to the other one because it's huge. Those Sunday is, press books are just massive. Exactly, and I will just say that the the Sundays that are printed here in color are from nineteen thirty four, and they're selective different runs, whereas this one is nineteen thirty one. So this kind of chronologically comes first, but then you can kind of read this and perhaps the second volume together. So. They're quite some um, big difference in size. Yeah, but, huge. Uh, regardless, uh, I would you can pick one of them over the other. They're just great for different reasons. This one, you know, with just a kind of highlight to show you, even though we're skipping ahead in time. But <laughs> yeah, 
Yep, that's great. Yeah, nice to see some of those in color for sure. Yeah, definitely. Gorgeous. Bright print run. Okay, let's take another little look at here. So these are the first few strips of Dick Tracy. And you can, like, if you know Dick Tracy at all, this is not usually how we see Dick Tracy. He doesn't have, like, the 90-degree angle or maybe 45-degree angle pointy nose. It's a lot more rounded. His fe facial features are softer. I mean, it still does look like Gould on a lot of, like, you know, the mouth extending to the cheekbones, that kind of thing. Uh, and the way he draws his women, but it isn't nearly as stylized as he becomes. But it still has that sense of 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 his style. The very very first comic strip here, we meet Dick Tracy and we meet Tess Trueheart and her parents. And right off the bat, we find out that they are going to be married, and they have a long and rocky relationship, a lot of ups and downs. Um, but this kind of sets the scene. Sets the scene for Dick Tracy, whom we know as a hard-boiled detective, but at the beginning, he's very actually, you know, he's a dashing gentleman. We don't, he, he hasn't gotten to that point yet. He's not the, uh, the, the hard-boiled detective until right at the very beginning, some robbers break in and shoot Tess Trueheart's father. And that sets off everything where uh, uh, Dick Tracy then goes to the police for help and they make him a plainclothes detective. And he goes on his spree. So it's very, very cool. It kind of hooks you right off the be at the beginning and it just is a nonstop ride from there. Uh, if last, last week I talked about Secret Agent X9 uh, with, uh, with Bruce Canwell and that book has very distinct stories like it's like one ends and then it says right in the corner box, it'll say coming next week, a new story or something like that. Uh, but Dick Tracy, once one story ends, it sort of bleeds into the next one or he'll start little uh, plot points that will start slow while one story is wrapping up and then start wrapping and then like take off once, once the story is finished. Here's a cool panel right here. I like some of the stuff he does here where the, He's got kind of an inset around. Uh, so you were see looking in the inside of the car. Uh, he does some great layouts. Um, There's a lot of great detail. And I, I just will comment on that. I guess just in general, Dick Tracy is a great example. But with a lot of comic strips, for those who are probably not you know, aware of, like comic strips are a great encapsulation of the time that they're from. Like So this yes. was like 31. So... These cars, whilst they kind of stand out as, oh, that's, you know, one of those comical old timey cars, it is actually like it's, it's st look out the window and that, that was a thing at the time, you know, like, and yeah. everything from the lighting, the furniture and all these strips, they, they perfectly capture what was commonplace in Detroit in, in, or, you know, in North America at that time. Look at this guy getting hit by a train. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. No, no doubt. There is just so much uh, excitement nonstop through here. Uh, Dick Tracy is also known for his, its colorful villains. If you've seen, especially the the um, the movie from the '90s, like this volume actually doesn't have any of those colorful villains. That's something that Gould will uh, will develop later on, a few years down the road. Sorry, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. Was um, Al Pacino's character in that big boy based on the kind of the central antagonist in the first arc of? Yes, this? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was actually, I, I should say, I'm actually a late comic to that film as well. I only watched it a couple of years ago, but I was just astounded that I somehow missed it during my childhood. <laughs> yeah. I, man, that movie was so big in the 90s. I remember like. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing media tie-ins and like I I remember the um the the McDonald's tie-ins. Um actually I can't even remember what the tie-in is, but I remember having to collect a whole bunch of stuff and going there a bunch of times to try and collect a whole bunch of things. But I must, uh, just, I must have just missed that because I was <laughs> guilty of having every McDonald's happy, happy <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so we meet the chief. The chief is one of the major players, Chief Brendan. And uh, he, he'll 
that's kind of our cast of characters. And we'll meet Pat a little later on in the book. And then of course, way later on in the book, one of the, the prominent stories in this volume is, uh, where did he go? Is meeting the kid who is uh, who lives with this tramp and um, Steve the Tramp. And Steve the Tramp gets Junior here to do a lot of his dirty work, stealing and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and then eventually, eventually the kid will become a member of Dick Tracy's supporting cast and in, uh, in a big way. Oh, there's Pat right there, his partner, Pat. He look, kind of looks like Tintin, I think. <laughs> there is a school name for that, of that drawing style, but it's, yeah. And, and just, can I just comment as well, just as factors, just even as you're casually glancing through those pages, just the beautiful silhouette work, the cross hatching, even so early yep. on in the script, he's just, Chester's got such a style that, you know, like gives it its own. Definitely. Way. So yeah, we're getting cross hatching in the foreground and also the background, but then the silhouettes here to create, um, uh, what do you call it? Just the uh, dimensions to create depth to the panels here. Uh, you, I love the texture we get on, on his face as well as um, the, the, the cross hatching on his plaid coat. Yeah, there's just a lot of really great details. He's an excellent artist. As far as like, even just those, just for once again, just to refresh people, like this is 1931. So we're talking about, you know, in the U S and like Chicago, which is basically the town that this is based in is there was the end of the roaring twenties, which was like a kind of an era of decadence. And then you had also uh, prohibition, which is feeding yep. a lot of this organized crime elements, you know, their, their money. And then you also had the Great Depression, which kicked, you know, like the market, uh, Wall Street market collapse in 29, basically two years prior to the beginning of the strip. So the context is kind of laid out for you there without having to say, like, you know, I guess by modern day storytelling where it's like, here is, you know, the Depression 1931. It's just, kind of, you know, just easing you in there. And everyone at the time knew what was going on. They didn't have to spell out that this is a vagrant, you know? Yeah. Definitely. And that's what he, that's what Junior represents here is the depression. And because uh, Tr Tess Trueheart, while she's not a wealthy person, um, she definitely is not an unwealthy person either. And so that's, uh, it's, it's neat to, to see kind of this cast come together, coming from different sides of the tracks and how they interact with each other. And Chester Gould does a really good job of balancing all of those personalities and giving them adequate screen time or page time, what do you want to call it, and uh, showing off their their skills and their different views in the different situations. Now, I got a comment here from Jeff. He says, January 11 to 12, 1932. Let's see if we can find that. It's in this book. Early examples of Gould drawing great snow, something he did very well over the years. January 11 and 12. Yeah, that is nice. Oh, let me hide that comment there. It's so easy to overdo rain and stuff like that in a panel to make it so messy. But uh, if you get the perfect amount of lines in there, then it looks, yeah, and I like this with a, using the negative space to create a little window right here. Definitely, less is more. Yeah, looks great. Uh, and then, of course, there are some culturally dated things here. Can a woman keep a secret? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. So, there is a that, preface, I will, sorry, I was going to say, there is a preface that does say at the very beginning of the book that uh, the strips reprinted in this volume were produced in a time where racial caricatures played a larger role in society and popular culture. They also probably mean sexism as well, but uh, yeah, it's the product of its time, which is the charm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, you have to read this in the context of this, the time. They're obviously not appropriate at all, but um, that was kind of how things were done back then. Mm -hmm. uh, we, get a, we get a lion in this strip, that's kind of cool. So the, here's another thing is that the first bunch of pages, the first few months in this book don't have Sundays. It just goes, the, the Sundays followed a different continuity than the dailies. So we just go daily after daily after daily until a few months in when, um, actually it's probably more than a few months in. That's just to show everyone, that's the difference. Okay, hold on a second. Let's, yep, no, no, let, no let me get your camera back. Oh, sure, no problem. 
Fair, yep. Just, just for kind of reference, that's kind of the title card that you'd see at the top of the Sunday strip. Yeah. Uh, further on. Uh, where are the Sundays? Um, yeah, and then, yeah, we get the Sundays reprinted here. They're formatted differently than the Sunday press book that we see. We have it, um, you know, the half tab kind of rather than the full page. Uh, and it's small, and you can see, look at all of the words on here. Look at how much dialogue is in this. It's like, because the um, that that other Sunday press book that you showed us, how big it was, that's actual size. That is how big the, the comic strips actually got to be in the newspapers back in the day. This is like, you know, a quarter, literally a quarter of the size of the actual strip. So it's actually kind of small which is one of the reasons why Dean wanted to, uh, to, to increase the size when he took over the series, because the Sunday pages get quite tiny with all that dialogue. Quick, quick uh, quiz for you. Who has more text per bubble? The Bungle family? <laughs> or, or, or Dick Dan Tracy. Very, yes, or Dick Tracy. In the I don't know. I mean, look at all of this dialogue. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But let me tell you, though, it's, it's all great it's crime noir style writing. If you really dig into it and actually read everything, and if you're the type of person that puts different voices and like New York accents into your head and all that kind of stuff, then it's a lot of fun. Um, there's no dialogue in here that feels like it's forced. Although, you know, sometimes he has to recap what happened in the previous day in the first panel. That's a little forced, but that's kind of the reality of a daily strip. But it's really, really good dialogue. A lot of fun. And as far as like just for everyday people back in 1931, this was their daily statement. You know, like television wasn't a thing and yep. movies were a luxury and they were fighting a depression. So every day this was your bit of entertainment, this and, you know, a handful of other strips. So that dialogue, you may have, you know, casually kind of thought, oh, it's too much by modern day standards. But back then that's probably feeding that person's entertainment, you know, for the day. Yeah. And it's it's so interesting to think like, this is going to, sometimes you could go through a page of a comic book nowadays and read one page in 30 seconds because they use dialogue very sparingly. But this is going to take you, you know, two or three minutes to go through, which is bang for your buck. It's a, <laughs> it's great. And it, mean, and it means that if you're going to go through all 29 of these volumes of Dick Tracy, it's quite an undertaking. It's a big project. It will. Make sure you've got a good comfy seat to sit in. <laughs> yes. Uh, Josh says the Billy Ireland Museum in Columbus has Chester Gold's desk prominently displayed. It's cool to see it. The sides are all blackened from where he struck matches on it. Wow. Man, I would love to go to Ohio sometime and check that out. It's, it's on my bucket list. I definitely want to visit there. I didn't even know you could strike matches with the, I thought it was like, wasn't it white phosphorus that used to be the ones you could just light off an abrasive surface. <laughs> He's got a permanent station to strike on. It's pretty insane. Here's a cool one where he uses black very effectively and then like a gunshot. Very cool. I can just imagine on new, real, real newsprint all of that ink coming off on your fingers. Uh, at, the, at, at the back of this book, once we get to the very end, oh, here's another great use of cross hatching and silhouettes. Everything, this one takes place at night. So you get the beam from the headlights, kind of the only thing that's really casting the light and everything else is in the shadow using lines to indicate the blackness. Very cool stuff. I'm a fan of the lettering, I've got to say. Like the lettering is just gorgeous. It's, it's, it's not hard to kind of, it, it's a sans serif typeface he's using. Like obviously he's hand lettering it. It's just before yep. digital. But it's it's just great, like especially when he like certain bubbles, he'll start to you know like a character will shout something and they'll just um you know it's it's emboldened, it's quite large, yeah. Can, a dramatic effect, obviously. You know, totally. You know, reading out in a New York accent or a, a Boston accent or a yeah, just makes it louder. You kind of you're more engaged at that point. Yeah, here's a good example. Look at that one right there, Dick Tracy. Look out! Someone's shooting at us. Quick, Mister Steel. You and Junior, get in the house. He's yelling it. It's, it's great. Uh, okay, so I was saying before I interrupted myself that uh, at the at back of the book, they have a se se special section for the non-continuity Sunday pages. These are the ones that didn't fit 
with the story that they are telling with the dailies early on. Uh, for some reason, they put these ones in color. So we do get a sample of what color Dick Tracy looks like. They are only marginally um, restored enough, they're cleaned up enough that they present well here, but they're printed, they printed it all on yellow. Um, I, uh, you know, they colored the paper yellow, so it kind of looked like old newsprint. You can see his color palette is very limited at this time. He only gets to play with a very small handful of num of, of colors. What was the, I guess the printing technology at that time was limited. I mean, we see some yeah. great examples of what, like, I mean, if you think of like, say, Gasoline Alley at the time, or, um, you know, Little King, uh, little, sorry, Little, uh, yeah, the Little King, like there's some great colors from that era. Um, they managed to do a lot with what little they had. Yes, that's true. And you can use it effectively. But in, in these ones, there's definitely a lack of, um, there's lack of green. It's mostly just blues and reds. Whoops. I lost my connection on my other phone. But that's okay. Uh, it, we, um, yeah, it's interesting to see. I'll hold it up here so we can have a look here. Um, yeah, it's interesting to see the uh, uh, the color choices. It, and with the faded yellow newsprint look, it looks like it's a bunch of like earthy tones and stuff. But then once you get later on, uh, some of the last strips in here, it looks like we have a little bit more green, but it's all kind of just, it looks really, really faded. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they didn't do it in color, especially with these early years, they just didn't have adequate materials or anything like that, um, quite possible. I imagine uh, it's quite a lot of work to restore coloration. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And um, let's see here, I'm gonna try and get my second camera back because I wanna show off what the, uh, the difference between these two, these two volumes, the bigger size and the smaller size. So let's, Get me back here. Oops, I'm back. back. Uh, and I'm going to solo this just a second. Okay. These are our two books. I just took the dust jacket off of Dick Tracy Volume 1. Oops, get those out of the way. But you can see our size here is uh, quite a bit bigger than this one. So we'll open it up to take a look at what it looks like inside. So the the uh, these ones have uh, three strips, three dailies per page, whereas this one has two dailies. So they are pretty much the same size, the dailies, in terms of the height and the width, uh, but we get three per page, which means we can cram more dailies into one book than we can uh, in the smaller size. But where it really makes a difference is the Sunday pages. So let's find a Sunday here. Here's a Sunday. And then I'll find a Sunday uh, here as well. Oops. I want to find one that has the title. Oh, maybe I can't. Here, let's bring it up. I need to bring it around the side. There's the difference. It's, um, you know, it actually isn't a whole, isn't that big of a difference, but uh, we do get this topper, the top panel here. Um, it just feels like it has a little bit more room to breathe, but it's, uh, you're right. It, um, now that I'm comparing them, maybe I didn't do this before. But uh, I, I think it is a little bit bigger. I'd have to take out my ruler. But as the years go by and the newspaper panels shrink, um, the Chester Gold starts drawing things more sparsely anyway, leaving out more room in his panels because the newspaper page is shrinking his comics smaller and smaller. So he has to compensate in his artwork for that. So uh, as the years go on, it's, they do get easier to read. And the production value on the um, on the later volumes is just a lot more crisp, I'd say. Like the, um, they're I don't know if they're taken from tear sheets or from what sources, but they yeah they're just a 
Yeah, so Chester Gould has a lot of his, um, uh, he in his, his estate has all of the, the syndicated proof sheets. And so we get to reproduce all of the, 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 the comics from the proof sheets, which means we're getting, you know, very, very nice reproduction quality, very crisp lines. Um, yeah, very clear. Okay, we've got a couple of other comments here. Jeff says, 46 years of Dick Tracy collected. What a great accomplishment, Loak. Thank you for sticking with this series. Here's the question everyone asks. Now, what about reprinting the first six in the larger format? Curtis, you didn't think that I'd not ask this again, did you? <laughs> of course, Jeff. I did have that question lined up as well, but uh, I thought I'd wait. <laughs> I knew that someone was going to ask it sooner or later, but um, they, so... I will say uh, I can't give a definitive answer because we don't have a definitive answer. We, it's not certain yet whether or not we're going to do that. I will say that Dean does want to go back and do the six volumes in a larger size. Um, but, you know, we have to take things into consideration, like if IDW is on board and, uh, you know, the we most of these early six volumes are out of print already. So I think that makes it an easier sell. Like we're not just retreading old material with a bunch of books that IDW still has in their warehouse. So uh, I think maybe they might want to wait for the rest of those books to sell out first or something. Um, but yes, Dean does want to do that. Dean also would love to carry on um, with the Max Collin years and uh, continue doing Dick Tracy. And that's not a sure thing yet either um, because you know, no contracts have been signed or anything like that yet. So that's, uh, but he has like, everyone's asking for more Dick Tracy. And uh, after 29 volumes of selling well, it still seems to be something that people want. So, you know, why not try to make that happen? But that's, that's a little far off in the future. Um, of course, we don't have the same access to proof sheets because Chester Gould didn't keep the proof sheets of the Max Collin years. Why would he? Uh, so we have to go on the hunt to try and find that kind of stuff. And um, Max Allen Collins himself has donated all of his stuff to a university in Iowa. So maybe we can check out over there. You know, there's just a whole bunch of stuff to, to consider when we're jumping into the next, the next era of Dick Tracy. Uh, and then Bill says, the interesting show tonight. Thanks. I'd really like to continue into the Colin years of Dick Tracy. So hopefully, Bill, we can help you out there. Um, but you'll have to stay tuned uh, into the future to see what happens. Uh, Mark has a comment. He wants to tell us that Chelsea House, the, uh, a publishing company, reprinted those same Sunday strips in color in their Dick Tracy, the 30s volume from the late 80s. And that 30s volume was my first exposure to Dick Tracy. There, my first exposure to Dick Tracy was a book that was in my library, local library as a kid. It was, uh, it didn't have a, a proper cover because I guess maybe it had come apart. And you know how libraries will rebound their books and they'll just have a plain cover with a little stamp, gold stamp that says Dick Tracy right on it. And I think it, I can't remember what the book was actually called, but it had, um, it had some stories throughout the years of Dick Tracy. And I read through that book. I borrowed it from the library many times. And I'm like, wow, this is really, really cool stuff. Because I had never experienced any comics like that. It was just like Spider-Man and whatever. Dick Tracy was something different. It was very, very cool. I, myself, I'm, I'm a, I grew up in the 90s. So I kind of missed, I literally missed the film by a couple of years. And I'm more yeah. of a Batman generation because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure a lot of people grew up, uh, where is it? This one here, this animated series must have been a lot of people's exposure to Dick Tracy and associate characters at some point. Yeah, that that uh, is a, such a, an odd cartoon because Dick Tracy doesn't actually appear. He appears at the beginning to he give does. his assistants the mission. And then the assistants are in the rest of the, the episode fighting off all the bad guys. And then Dick Tracy comes back on the on at the end saying, good job, we did a, a good thing today getting that criminal off the street. And then the episode ends. <laughs> it's like, I wanted to see Dick Tracy in action. I wonder what the uh, licensing agreement was there. <laughs> you get to use 10% of Dick Tracy and then 90% original characters. I wonder also if it was just hard to animate the realistic proportions of Dick Tracy because all of his sidekicks are cartoony characters. 
So it's uh, it's probably way easier to animate cartoony characters because you don't have to get the movements as realistic. And they even stylized all of the villains to be a yes. lot more cartoony as well in that series. Black well, Top is very stylized. Yep. Yeah. It's fun though. If you can find a copy of that DVD set, it's a lot of fun. I, I've got one too. But yeah, I mean, Dick Tracy was so popular back in the day. He had uh, several movie serials. I'll bring that up as well. And the serials, yeah, exactly. Like from 1937 onwards, so like six years after a script's invention, it's already like live in action. That's just amazing. I guess back then, different, you know, like it wasn't like a straight to a television set. It's, yeah. <laughs> People want more Dick Tracy in their life. Yeah, and that was kind of the way with all newspaper comic strips. It's like everybody from you know, Blondie and Bringing Up Father and Steve Canyon, Tearing the Pirates, everyone had a movie serial. It was kind of like those were the, the the superstar pop culture figures of the day. And then at where we grew up through the 80s and 90s, comics became kind of like a, nobody really wants to talk about them. And, <laughs> and uh, they're just for kids. And there would be a Spider-Man cartoon on TV, but that's about it. And um, And now we're in another era where comic books are cool again and and like with all the marvel movies and every show on netflix seems to be an adaptation of comics snowpiercer and sweet tooth and all of this and so we're we're at a great a really cool point uh where we could see this stuff come back i want to see some more dick tracy on tv like a tv you, series yeah i was thinking the same as well i was thinking today how how would you reinterpret dick tracy in a like even in a modern day setting like could you do it could it be done uh, or even if you did it i guess dated in the 1930s because i mean the characters somewhat age in, as the strips go on but dick himself i don't think he ever really ages much like he they kind of place him as a young man everyone refers to him as a, a young man at the beginning of the comic in, in this time but he doesn't age in real time so yeah you could you could do anything you could even take a spin on it and have old man Dick Tracy. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the grizzled guy. And then like Junior is an adult and he's taken up the, the mantle or something. But uh, no, I don't know. I think doing a period piece and having Dick Tracy in the 30s mm. in the crime ridden Chicago would be amazing. What a, what a fantastic show that would be. Um, we've seen a little bit of that. Uh, I think Powers is kind of a modern day dick tracy-ish kind of a thing except that one deals with superheroes so it's a little bit different powers yes there you go <laughs> um but uh there's definitely some dick tracy influence there definitely. did you just curious did you get a chance to see the uh later latest kind of reboots of the dick tracy in the comic strip series that idw put out uh not really no i saw a couple samples online as such they were, they were pretty decent attempts at kind of like almost like rebooting the characters in a soft way to kind of introduce a new generation to it. So if you do get a chance, or viewers at home, it's worth checking out. There was two different runs, short, short, limited runs, but um, that's yeah, very cool. If you like that, definitely check these out because they're in the same kind of fashion. Michael Reed wants to also let it, uh, point out the, the parody, the Dick Tracy parody, Fearless Fosdick from Little Abner. Yeah, what a great parody that is. I love it. Um, well, you know, I think this is a, this has been a great conversation. Oh, here's one question we forgot to answer. Um, do either of you have a favorite villain from Dick Tracy? Do you have a favorite villain, Jim? I think Flattop. Flattop seems to be the character I, I quite like. He's kind of like the, yeah. main, the prime villain. Definitely. I would agree with that. Flattop is excellent. I also like um, the brow. Yes, I think he's he's cool too. Um, but man, there are just so many weird oddball characters that are that are are great fun um, over the years. I like the way everyone else thinks as well at home watching. What are some of your favorite? Yeah, yeah. Leave a comment with your favorite Dick Tracy character. We'd love to hear from you too. Is it Mumbles. <laughs> Mumbles is cool. I I liked Mumbles. Mumbles <laughs> I liked his interpretation in the movie as well. I yes. thought that was really cool. Dustin Hoffman, uh, just such a great performance in that. You kind of, that's also one thing I will say about the film, it, even though it's, you know, it's kind of set in that time of 1990s. There's such great acting talent who play all these characters and they're just hidden under layers of prosthetics. Yeah. And you're like, is that Al Pacino? Is that Dustin Hoffman? Is that, you know, like, uh, yeah, just, you just see so many of them. Yeah. So. It's incredible. It is. It's a great cast of characters and great cast of actors. Um, and there's a comics, there's a comic book adaptation of the Dick Tracy movie 
by Kyle Baker. Have you seen that before? Uh, I, I don't. Done. I've got it on my bookshelf downstairs. I don't. I should have brought it up here with me, but it's just it's so good because Kyle Baker has a very stylized look that is, you know, it's kind of in the the Chester Gold family of okay. styles. It's a little bit more extreme. But it looks so good. It's actually one of my favorite comics. Is uh, is that adaptation just because of Kyle Baker's interpretation? It's very very cool. As far as like I know, Kyle Baker's like a really elastic kind of style of motion. Like he kind of conveys yeah. fluidity. Like uh, yeah, I know in that yeah. one of those books I was talking about before, the one uh, written by Leo, sorry Michael Red and his family, and um, drawn by Rich Tommaso, was um, very similar. Like they're kind of like. They're not static, like I guess Chester Gold style. They're more kind of fluid. Like Tracy's kind of like jumping and leaping, and his legs are kind of like bowed. So yeah. it's yeah, it's it's great reinterpretation of of the static strip. It's very cool. Yeah. Michael Reed says his favorite characters are Pruneface and Mrs. Pruneface. Yeah, I don't think that I've gotten quite that far in my Dick Tracy reading yet to know those characters, but uh, um, but that's cool. Uh, and then Josh says I'm a big fan of Shaky. As a villain, Sh shaky. <laughs> don't know. If, I don't know that one very well either. Man, there are just there are so many villains over the twenty-nine like volumes. I would say like it contends with Batman's Rogue Gallery as far as like the you know like a, this is a character and these are reflections of him in the same way. You know, like the you yeah. know, this is Tracy's. Okay, well, I think we should probably wrap up our conversation no. here. Um, I'll show off this. I got to put the dust jacket back on this book. There you go. You got it too. Yeah. Dick Tracy, <laughs> Volume One, 1931 to 1933. Very important book in the history of comics, in the history of adventure strips, uh, and it's just a fun read right from the start. It it, it takes off uh, with a just you know with a, literally with a gunshot and uh, and just keeps on going nonstop. A, a lot of fun. A lot of people blast uh, the later years of Dick Tracy for going a little off the rails, uh, but uh, these these early years are just pure crime-driven adventure drama fun. I will also just chime in and say that if anyone hasn't touched Dick Tracy before and they're curious based on what we've talked about today, the first volume, first I think three volumes are priced at uh, thirty dollars US. So it's a great introductory price. Like before, you, I mean, they don't really increase too much for each of the volumes, but if you're just looking to try your hand at it and you can find a copy, it's yeah, you should be able to get it for a pretty reasonable price. Yeah. Uh, these early volumes are going out of print uh, fairly quickly. They've been reprinted a number of times over the years, but I think IDW is letting them purposely fall out of print now, and uh, they won't be reprinted. So if we can get the six volumes uh, at a larger size, that would be great. You can hold out for that. Um, but at the at the time right now, that's not a guaranteed thing. So you may want to try and track down these older ones as well. <laughs> so you'll have to uh, weigh weigh the odds on that. I will gladly double dip. I will buy the next set and keep the original set. Yeah, just to have those two different shades of yeah, the same. <laughs> I think a lot of people will be in the same boat. I'll probably be in the same boat too. Um, okay, so uh, Jim, are there places online where people can find you? Do you want to uh, p promote sure. your social media or anything? You can find me on most social media um, with the at symbol, and then my name is Jim. It's spelled C for Charlie, E for Echo, M for Mike, and then Selamet, S E L A M E T. Um, or you can find me, uh, I've got a new YouTube channel which I've started, uh, which kind of reviews books that don't really get a lot of limelight. So a lot of comic strip books, a lot of uh, graphic novels. Uh, that's uh, See You in the Funny Papers. Nice, perfect. Uh, and you can see both of us over on the Library of American Comics newspaper strip appreciation group on Facebook. So make sure you tune in there. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and watching our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you can leave some comments here. I'll try to address comments that are made after the, the video is ended. <laughs> I love that. That's so great. <laughs> Um, but otherwise, um, I'm on vacation next week, so there will be no episode next Friday. But the week after that, we'll be back, and we'll talk with Dean Mullaney about uh, some comic strips. I don't know what yet, but we'll see. So uh, thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thanks,